Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. Now, part of best health, a huge part of best health, not all of it, is what you put in your mouth and the quality of it. In COVID, it's now May 7th, I really depend on my local farmer's market. I go every single Saturday to the farmer's market and I start chit-chatting and Elliot Coleman's name came up the last few weekends because let me tell you about Elliot Coleman. And so I went ahead and invited him on the show and that's who we have on the show today. We're talking to him in Maine. He is one of the heroes, one of the iconic figures of organic gardening and what we put in our mouth. Now, I know Elliot, and he knows me from our youth. Scott Nearing and Helen Nearing started the Good Life, was it called Forest Farms? Forest Farm, and it became the Good Life Center after their death. Right. They had a big mailbox with the Good Life Center. And Scott Nearing and Elliot Coleman are credited with really starting the field of organic gardening. So today on the show, after I introduce Elliot, we're going to talk all about what is organic, where you get organic, the difference between what you buy at a farmer's market or from an organic gardener, because Elliot had a lot to do with the certification for organic and what you can get in the organic section of um, your local grocery store, maybe even Walmart. But I'm going to introduce him, and then we're going to talk about how we go way back because we've known each other from our youth and from Helen and Scott Nearing starting forest farms in Maine, Harborside, Maine, Penobscot Bay. In fact, I remember building a log cabin with Brent and get, gathering the rocks from the ocean yep. and the sphagnum moss and the cement and digging the, the root cellar, putting candles in the snow because the, the snow was coming and the root cellar leaked because we didn't do such a great job. We're going to talk about all of that. Let me just introduce you so we can get in a conversation. So Elliot Coleman is really, if you talk to any farmer and you mention your name, they stand up straight and go, oh my God, because you're a hero. He's a farmer, an American farmer, an author, agricultural researcher, educator, and he is, along with Scott Nearing, credited with starting organic gardening. His book, The New Organic Grower, is an important read for organic gardeners, especially if they're ones that sell at the market. Now, this is cool. He served for two years as executive director of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements. He was an advisor to the United States Department of Agriculture during the 1979 and 80 study report and recommendations on organic gardening. And that document helped form the basis for today's legislated national organic program in the United States. So right now we're talking to Elliot at his four season farm. So if you look up Elliot Coleman or you put in organic gardening, you'll see four season farm come up. That's in Harborside, Brookville, Maine, which is where I hung out with him. It was then called Harborside, Maine, or Harborside, Maine is made up of Penobscot Bay and Brookville, Maine. We're going to talk about really what that means. And he yeah, Har Harborside is just a village of the town of Brooksville. Okay. How is it different from where we hung out at Forest That's, Farm? It, it's it. It, it. Harborside is the peninsula of Cape Rozier that sticks out into Penobscot. Got Bay, and is it that, is all a part of the town of Brooksville, Maine. Is that where we were together years ago? You got it. You got it. So this is Scott and Helen's land. Is that what this is? The the land I am now farming, I purchased from Scott and Helen Nearing uh, back in 1965. Wow. I remember sleeping. You had a little teeny woodshed with a stove in it, and I'd work with you guys all day long, and then I'd go climb up and sleep upstairs in that woodshed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It so, wasn't luxury, but it was fun. <laughs> it was totally fun. But the cool thing is Scott had these gardens where he, there's not a lot of growing season in Maine. It's short. And he had these huge rock walls that he dug into the earth several feet down and many feet up. And we built those rock walls or people that came to visit him every summer did and that extended the growing season. You have 
year-round growing season. And we're going to want to talk to you about that. And the fun thing that you say is you even manage with your special tools to make such long growing season in Maine that normally has a short one. You managed to grow artichokes claiming that I grow them just to make the Californians nervous. (laughs) (laughs) So can you, so first let's talk about our past together and let's talk about how you really have formed this movement and pushed it forward. Um, Tell us a little bit about how you first met Scott Nearing. Well, I was fortunate enough uh, to go into a bookstore in Vermont and run across a copy of the book called Living the Good Life by Scott and Helen Nearing. And uh, I was thumbing through it, and all of a sudden, they're talking about how you can actually live on a small farm and and, uh, make a success of it. And in the back of my mind, all my life, I'd always wanted to live on a small farm. I don't know where that came from, but it was probably because I enjoyed being out in the wilderness and the idea of eventually ending up with a job in an office was just horrifying. And so I uh, came and met the Nearings, and we got along very well. And uh, my first wife and I were looking for land to go do just that. And uh, we got along with them so well, they offered to sell me 60 acres on the back of their farm. And the wonderful thing about it, since they were such nice people and wanted to encourage others to do this, they sold me the land for $33 an acre. I paid them $2,000 for 60 acres. And I have since sold three pieces of that to friends for the same $33 an acre, just because I thought I shouldn't be the only one on the receiving end of such a nice gift. So that is the land we're on. It had one flaw, which probably made it worth $33 an acre. It was all covered in spruce and fir forest. So before we could start farming, we had to get out the bow saws and the axes and uh, and chop down trees and pry out stumps and roll away all the rocks that the glacier had left. But uh, that was fun. It made it even more of an adventure. I remember when Scott was building a pond and he didn't want to use any kind of tractor or anything. Just every day he'd go out there. And after he'd sighed a little of the Queen Anne's lace and tall grass, and then he'd just get a few wheelbarrows out and slowly but surely he dug his pond. He offered, he and Helen offered me an acre for nothing. But I was yes. so young and I had no one to do it with that I stupidly didn't take it. I keep kicking myself in the patooties, but they uh, were so kind. Yeah. No, they were very generous people, very knowledgeable people. And Scott was so meticulous. Uh, I don't know where his notebooks are, but I think uh, some library has them. He kept track every day of how many wheelbarrows of soil he'd taken out of that pond. I remember his compost piles. They all had driver's licenses and numbers on them. There were many of them. What do your compost piles look like today? Oh, we do it on a larger scale. We make the walls of the compost heap out of uh, spoiled hay bales. And so our heaps are about 12 feet wide and about 50 feet long. And the nice thing about using spoiled hay bales as the walls is they keep it moist right to the edge. Uh, You don't have an edge where the wind is blowing on it, so it decomposes nicely. And when that compost pile itself is finished, the walls, the old bales, then become ingredients in the next compost heap. How many acres of land do you have in farm now? We are presently growing vegetables on two acres. After selling pieces to friends, I had 40 acres left, but I decided when I started that two-thirds of that should belong to Mother Nature. So we only cleared 14 of those 40 acres. And uh, the part that isn't in intensive vegetables and greenhouses now is uh, covered with grass fields and orchards and uh, just our house and other buildings. Now, I remember the house... Well, first, of course, Scott had had his PhD and taught it, I think it was Penn State, 
or the uni- what, I think University was, of Pennsylvania. University of yeah. Pennsylvania. And he sp- he wrote a lot for the socialistic worker. He had 55 books out. And yes. he spoke up saying we need child labor laws, that children were being abused. And because of that, he was blackballed to ever teach again in the school system until that eventually became law. But he was the first person on the front line and got blackballed. So he went originally to Vermont and built a lot of different homes and started maple syruping and ultimately found his way to Maine. And they would build their homes and we helped build the garden walls. They would collect rocks and Helen would call one group of rocks the uglies and one the beauties. And the beauties got on the outside of the wall and the uglies got on the inside. So yep. what do you make, what's your house built of? And what is what does the lay of the land look like we're, we're talking to you at? Well, the we just have a regular wood framed house uh and that uh uh, we had it built we participated in the building but the house we had when you were first here that i had built for one thousand dollars after just arriving here uh lasted uh, quite a while but uh then we finally took it down because we built this house and this house is larger than one would expect, but it's because I am such a total book nerd, and my wife is also. We refer to it, us as biblioholics, and we have acquired and put together such an enormous library of books on useful topics like uh, uh, how to eat and how to farm and uh, and so forth that uh, I would say, oh my God, almost. Uh, Uh, a quarter of this house is a library. There's even a section up on the second floor that we uh, refer to as the stacks because it looks just like the stacks in a university library. So uh, a a passion for books is a wonderful thing, but you can get carried away with it. Now, I remember that in the summertime, people would come from all over the world interested in living the good life and learning about earning a, a living by your own sweat and brow, and people would come and have jobs to do to help build and farm and garden. And at night, they would sit by the fire and they would tie together faggots to put into the wood stove or to hear Scott read out of some of his books or have him sit. Remember, he used to sleep on that little teeny pad. He didn't have a regular yep. mattress that he slept on yep. to keep his back straight. He was no, re- and the. The, what was underneath that pad was his coffin. What? And what do you he mean? Had had a, he had had a coffin built, and he figured that was the right length and size, and so he had a sleeping pad built on top of it. Why did he have a coffin built? Just to be because he was so meticulous to be prepared? I guess to be prepared. <laughs> I did not know that. And it yeah. was this little leather mat that was yes. only about three quarters of an inch thick. And he laid on yeah. that to sleep at night. He, he believed in living like a monk, very definitely. Definitely. He was so interesting. How did, how did he inspire you and how, how who you are today has little tethers to the past of Ellie, oh, of uh, oh, Scott. Gosh, yes. I mean, both Scott and Helen were very socially active and concerned about the future of the world and the future of the world's population and uh, how all of us, by making intelligent decisions, could make the world a better place for all of its inhabitants. And, you know, that's a, an important message, but it was... It, you know, how can you resist that? Because that's about as noble and wonderful a way to think and act as you can find. You know, in the wintertime, they'd go to Manhattan and be very active in different types of things. And I, I remember sometimes it would be so cold because somehow they didn't have heat in that apartment that they would burn some of their furniture I'm in some of their papers. I mean, some of the stories. Helen was a concert pianist. When she met Scott, uh, and that bit concert of, violinist, violinist, violinist. Yeah, okay, not right. the musical instrument. Wrong. Oh, I thought it was a pianist. It was a. I never saw her play. Have you ever seen her play? Oh yeah, no. She used to occasionally dig out her violin and and play, and uh, 
uh, she went all over Europe for a number of years uh, to study uh, violin, but also to study theosophy. And right, theosophy. I met them at the Theosophy Society. That's right. where I met well, them. That was where she met uh, all sorts of fascinating people that influenced uh, her rather spiritual approach to uh, life, and one of whom was Krishnamurti, who was the leader of that movement. And basically, she became his girlfriend for about two years. <laughs> she was the, the, yeah, the spouse of very there. interesting people. Yeah. So how did that unfold, Elliot? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure they both grew off in other directions. But uh, it, I, part of Helen's interesting life, and uh, my daughter is now writing a book about Helen's background with, a, with the theosophy movement. and. Uh, because uh, she's always been uh, taken by that whole idea. Well, you know, I think my whole life, I w was up in Northern California when I was about 16 and a half. I just was in the middle of going to college. I started college at 16, was taking a break, and there was a Theosophical Society lecture of Helen and Scott Nearing talking about living the good life. Yeah. And I went there. And they said, you are what you eat. If you want to last a long time and do a lot of noble things in the world, you got to have a strong body and a strong spirit. You should eat organic. And I started, I said, that makes sense. So I've been really eating organic. They started the whole fire inside of me. Oh, yeah. Well, Scott died at the age of 100. So obviously it did him a good bit of good. Now, that's an interesting story of him. He always said that when he could no longer be a contributing member of society, he would fast himself to the next phase of existence. And he did. He fasted himself to death. And then Helen wrote a book called Living, Loving and Leaving the Good Life. Yes, yes. What do you think? Of, do you have, what are your plans? Anything overlapping oh, on that template? Oh. I, I've told my wife when I become old and useless on um, some uh, very, very cold winter day when there is a blizzard predicted, she's just supposed to put me out on the patio. <laughs> it's a very pleasant way to go, freezing to death. So. <laughs> you have a phone going off there. That's okay. How many kids do you have? Uh, I have three children. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh uh, I've been married twice, uh, uh, two by my first wife. and, and Right, I, I knew your first wife, wife, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, one of them, the, the youngest daughter, Clara, uh, moved back here a few years ago to help run the farm. Oh, that and is so, so great. Yeah, I now have probably the best uh, uh, educated farm manager I could have because she grew up in this game. And she, for a number of years, had her own farm. Uh, with her husband in Colorado. And then when that marriage broke up, she moved back east and uh, we built a house for her and the grandkids. And so, uh, and it's great because she loves all the parts of this that I never loved as much as I should have. So she just loves dealing with the customers, uh, running the crew during harvest and, uh, and uh, filling all the orders and everything. And I just like the farming part. So now, <laughs> you know, I get to prepare the fields and I still do a lot of rock picking and things like that. But uh, no, she's, uh, she's doing all the uh, office level work that I never really enjoyed. That's really cool. So yeah. where, do, where are your vegetables sold and which ones do you sell? We uh, are in business all year round. We grow about 55 different vegetables because we have a, a retail clientele. So we're basically a supermarket uh, all 12 months of the year. And during the summer months, we have a farm stand here at the farm. And during the winter months, there is a, uh, a winter farmer's market that we started in the town next door. That it happens Which town is that? Blue Hill. I remember blue. I remember one time there was a little meeting of all the citizens to do some kind of a joint decision, and we brought sandwiches and about twenty of us, and they asked us questions. We raised our hand. That was yeah. how the town got some things done. We raised our hand. Oh yeah, New England. 
<laughs> New England is very much into democracy in the old style. So there's this winter farmer's market from 1st of October to the end of April. And then 1st of May, we open our farm stand here and we run it uh, through the end of September. And so uh, up until uh, this year, second week in March, when we closed the winter farmer's market because of uh, uh, social distancing, uh, and then we have since then wholesaled everything we can grow to the local food co-op. And our produce is immensely popular, so the food co-op would be really happy if we suddenly became twice as big and grew twice as much. And we're probably going to reopen the farm stand this summer once uh, uh, reopening makes good sense and figure a way to, to keep people far enough apart from each other. So, you know, most people, when they hear that you raise 50 different vegetables, their mind just starts to be discombobulated. They can't even imagine what are 50 different vegetables. So can you oh, yeah, name no. some of the atypical <laughs> ones that people might not know about? Because most people only eat like about five or six of the same vegetables. Right. Well, you already mentioned the fact that uh, we grow artichoke, uh, globe artichokes here in, in Maine, which is not traditionally done. But you can have things like uh, salsify and scorzonera. These are root crops. Uh, the Europeans grow a lot of them. We grow a lot of celeriac, which is a, a, a celery that has been bred to have a, a turnip-shaped ball of that hard material in the bottom of the celery. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. And the reason we grow them is we're trying to figure out how New England can actually feed its citizens all year round. A lot of these go into storage for the winter. And uh, if we... Uh, never need to ship food in from California again, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> As a functional medicine doctor, we're always talking about the biome because our, a lot of our body is run by microbial life that lives in our nook and crannies, not just in our gut, but everywhere. But we, that we have huge amounts in our colon, but we even have biomes in our eyes and our lungs and our vagina and our, throughout our body. Um, in, in our sinuses, the more you eat a wider variety of foods, we always train everyone at, at our modules, the better the biome. So it would be so great if everyone could have access to such different types of foods like you're saying, because that creates a much healthier biome. Right. And the soil is playing the same game. And what has fascinated me is I call it uh, the by. Attic revolution, but all of a sudden, uh, farmers, uh, uh, agricultural researchers, and everybody have come to realize that the microbiological life in the soil, the soil microbiome, is what's powering everything. And pr prior, you know, for many, many decades, everybody was afraid of all the uh, uh, microorganisms in the soil because they could cause some plant disease or something like that. Well, people have realized, no, if you get plenty of organic matter in the soil and you have a biologically active fertile soil, you have a system that works miraculously to the point. I mean, the, the research coming out on this is almost miraculous, but plants can decide which of these microorganisms they want around their roots because they understand which ones benefit them. And they give off exudates from their roots to attract high populations of the microorganisms they most want there. And so these microorganisms are then able to induce resistance against pests and diseases in the crops and furthermore into the livestock that consume crops. And so the old saying in organic uh, agriculture uh, was that uh, organic farmers uh, uh, didn't need pesticides because healthy plants aren't bothered by pests. Well, it turns out that there is scientific data and detail on that, that it's absolutely true. It just requires treating the soil correctly. Now, if you're treating the soil that well and your plants don't have pests, it is very logical to assume, and I will not only assume it, I will tell you it's true, that eating that food is going to be far healthier for you than eating food 
grown with sterile chemicals in some sterile soil poisoned with uh, pesticide residues. I mean, the difference is so striking that most people would find it hard to believe if they saw all the data. Well, we're still going really strong and we've been eating, I think big part of it is we've been eating organic, but what you're saying, so there's a biome to the soil. That soil microbiome is talked about nowadays, the same as the human microbiome. Yes. And the plants can release exudate that attract what they know that they need most in that biome, almost like the plant is dating or intermingling with the soil. <laughs> I have a book out called The Sexy Brain, so I'm kind of interested in, in <laughs> connection. Connection. So it's interesting. Plants are connected so much to the soil that they can help dictate the biome. Uh, yeah, that, a content. lot of this research is coming out of Holland, where they do excellent uh, organic agriculture research at the universities. I mean, you know, in, in, during all the years back when you were first here, I mean, we were treated like uh, halfwits by oh, we uh, conventional agriculture. And, you know, I, I used to be really nice, but I'm not even nice anymore. I run into some of those old uh, uh, guys and I say, oh, yeah, have you yet learned how to spell wrong with a capital <laughs> W? Because you guys were, and, and most of them are admitting this, most of them are admitting that they bought into the line when they were in ag school that was not the truth. The line was coming from the influence of the agricultural chemical companies on the universities, telling them, oh, no, chemicals are the answer. These organic people are loonies. Well, I'm sorry. We were right all along. It's very similar to med schools that are so exactly. influenced by very, exactly. it's the same exact thing. You know, I was yeah. just watching, you know, I'm all alone in the pandemic and I'm trying to figure out how to keep my, my wits about me. So I was watching Seinfeld last night. I just love Seinfeld and we've all kind of grown up with Seinfeld and he yeah. was saying he was 65 years old. He was boasting about being 65. He said, when you're 65, if someone asks you a question, you can say no. He said, when I turn 70, I'm going to not even answer him at all or I'm going to tell them they're wrong. And that's what you're <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you're talking about the difference between people eating vegetables that are not the same as yours, can you give us the true definition of organic and what most people are buying in most stores? Well, this is a difficult topic for me to talk about because the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been co-opted by the uh, big time food processors to the point that the certified organic that they are supposedly in charge of is nowhere near what it used to be. If you want to eat the very best food, don't get it from the supermarket, buy it from a really principled local organic grower. Those are the people who are still doing it the way it should be done. And one of the major things that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been allowing, they have been allowing hydroponic food to be sold as organic. And if you go into your supermarket today, and I'm sorry to tell people this, uh, like I say, don't go into the supermarket, go buy it from your local uh, uh, principal grower. But practically all of the berries, blueberries, raspberries, uh, uh, strawberries, they're all grown hydroponically, uh, all of your... How do you... So I don't understand. Aren't some of these berries really on huge bushes normally? No. Yeah. And they grow them in pots of a sterile substance and feed them with a hydroponic uh, feed. You, so uh, are you talking are like no, about whole foods? I, I'm talking about every... Uh, store selling organic in the country. And if people want more information on that, uh, I'm working with a group of old time, hardcore organic farmers who would like to see things done the way the public expect. And the group is called the Real Organic Project. And if people put realorganicproject.com into Google, uh, they can find out a whole lot of information about this. The other thing they can do is go to our website, fourseasonfarm.com. F-O-U-R. Right. S-E-A-S-O-N, it's singular, seasonfarm.com. 
And uh, uh, if you click on our opinion, you will find uh, there are all sorts of other uh, interesting uh, articles that I've written there explaining this. And I really feel bad telling people that, but I want them to go to the people who are still doing this correctly, your local uh, farmers at the farmer's market and all of that. These are the people you want to be buying organic food from because they are still doing it the way it should be done. The ghost of my ovaries just collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> that is devastating news, but it explains a lot because we are getting sicker and sicker. Even people that are doing everything right are getting yeah. sicker and sicker. Yeah, and it's just because governments are not good at enforcing pure ideas. They are good at being uh, conned by those who want to uh, change uh, the uh, uh, the argument and they have been uh, the USDA has been totally uh, conned by the uh, uh, industrial food industry so do most when you go to a farmers market let's say like I'm going right now um, do most how do you find somebody that you know is using farming techniques where you're getting the highest quality food you can get if it's a small a uh, local farmer, I can guarantee you, your small local farmers are the people to buy from. They're still the people who are doing uh, organic as it was uh, uh, envisioned uh, uh, 100 years ago. The first of the ones I know about were, were 1920. And uh, it grew from then into the, th into the 30s and the 40s. And so then, how did uh, it start in the 1920s? So was that Scott or was that somebody no, else? Oh, no, no, no. That has a long history that actually goes back into the uh, 19th century. Uh, there was a movement in uh, Germany, the food reform movement. And if you know the history of agriculture, chemical fertilizers really didn't begin until about 1845. And then the pesticides they were using back then were a mixture of lead and arsenic. It was called lead arsenate. And a lead lot arsenate? Of lead arsenate? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of people uh, back then said, well, wow, you know, everybody's getting sick. This isn't right. We think it might be the fact that plants are being grown with chemicals and uh, being treated with, uh, with this horrible pesticide. Well, so they started a movement to encourage food to be grown with uh, compost and natural systems. And that finally developed by the time you got into the uh, uh, 19, 1910, 1920, into the early days of organic agriculture. And the name organic it came from a book in 1941. So that was the. Uh, uh, that was the first person uh, uh, to use the word organic to describe it. But it was logical because organic matter in the form of compost and plant wastes and all these things that are good to put back into the soil was the, the key to it. If I were to use another word, I would probably prefer to call it biological agriculture because that is the opposite of chemical agriculture. And biological agriculture is relying on all of those things that the soil does naturally, all these billions of bacteria that have been figuring out for billions of years how to uh, work in the soil with plants, and the plants have been figuring out how to work with the bacteria to create uh, the, the system that grows the best food. Oh, I want to go there and hang out and eat your food for a while. Other people <laughs> want to go to a hotel. I want to come visit you. Can we get some pictures of your farm and of you and your daughter and your wife that I, I haven't met this wife. I'd love to put some of those pictures up when we publish the show. That would be really great. If you get a hold of my publishers, Chelsea Green, Chelsea okay. Green Publishing in Vermont, uh, they can get you copies of all the pictures that have been in my book. And my wife, Barbara, took most of them. So they're really exceptional. She's a good photographer. Oh, interesting. I, you know, I think I actually, Chelsea Green Publishing, are they, are they still working a full-on publisher now? 
Oh, yeah. And they okay. are publishing an awful lot of the cool books on the, A Better Way to Live that okay. are, have always been popular. This is good to know. Good to know. Now, I have another question for you. Sure. So I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I remember there was this really cool guy named Brent, and he and I, we felled some trees one year in the summertime, and we let them dry, and then we had these round scythes these, um, that we cleared the branches and the next year and all the bark with. We sat yes. on the logs ourselves and cleared yes. them. And then, of course, he did a lot of the real heavy work. And I don't know, there were some guys, everyone was always coming in the summertime to meet Scott and you and Helen, and people would help out. And we ultimately built a small log cabin. And we that's what we were talking about before. We mixed between of the logs, sphagnum moss that we gathered in the area, cement, and then pebbles. We used to get these galvanized metal cans yep. of pebbles yep. from the water. They yep. weighed a lot. I think that's probably why I'm healthy today is I did so much of that work back then. We would put that in between the logs. I, I dug out the root cellar, which is why I've heard that it leaked. But I wondered if that log cabin still is in existence. It is still there. We moved it uh, about 500 yards to another part of the property. It is now the guest house for my daughter's house, the house that we built for my daughter recently when she returned to work here. Oh and Brett gosh. is still alive and well and he living is? just down the road. Yeah. <laughs> I got to go. I got to visit you guys. So how did you move? How did you move a log cabin? Uh, there are house moving companies that are very good okay, at coming okay. in, jacking it up, putting stuff under it and, and, towing it on a trailer a short distance that is a hoot that it is still in existence uh, yeah. and it's the guest house oh my goodness and i gotta come say hello to rep just i don't you, you should tell him that we're doing the show i i will i will tell him okay. that you asked about him okay what a hoot so um so did, let me just get this straight none None of the organic produce none i, I have to get this straight because this is no, you know not not none there are large-scale companies, but I mentioned specifically small fruits and tomatoes and, uh, and eggplants and peppers, because these are easily done by the hydroponic, uh, the, we call them the faux organic, the fake organic uh, industry. Uh, but it, the bulk, anything that needs to be grown in the soil, like, uh, like carrots and, and corn and those things, that, that's fine, that, that those rules have not been uh, twisted. But the high price stuff, the stuff that all of these companies looked for years and said, oh my gosh, we're selling our tomatoes, our chemical tomatoes for X. And the tomatoes that are organic are selling for three times X. And they just bribe their way into the business. And what's fascinating is a lot of your tomatoes, supposedly organic tomatoes in your supermarket, will be coming from Mexico, Holland, and Canada. Doing organic hydroponically is illegal in Mexico and Holland and Canada, but they sell it here and our USDA has declared it legal here. I mean, this is, this is enough to just really make one dislike government more than one naturally. So if it's still legal there, then I, I don't understand how Well, no, they can't sell it there. Oh, oh, oh I see what you, but they can they still can't grow it. They can't call it organic if they grow it or I, organic. If, uh, okay, got you. So, but they can ship it here. I mean, anyway, if people are interested, uh, go on the website of the Real Organic Project. And this is just a bunch of us old guys who started this game many, many years ago who are trying to save it from being totally uh, cheapened. Well, I don't mean to belabor the point, but you know, a lot of people rely on Whole Foods to get their organic. So if you do walk into a Whole Foods, what food in there do you think is really healthy organic food so that we would know? I, I don't mean yeah. to push you into a yeah. corner, but this is no, an important question. No. Uh, avoid the, the small fruits because I know uh, probably all of them are now uh, hydroponic. Uh, so those and, would uh, be, those would be? Uh, strawberries, raspberries, uh, blueberries. 
Okay. Uh, blackberries, I think they do those also. And avoid the uh, out-of-season uh, tomatoes because they're all coming from a hydroponic uh, greenhouse. And, you know, you should, you, I think if the people listening to your show want to help change this, go in there and say to the produce manager, you know, march to the back of the store, say, I want to meet the produce, produce manager, and say, where are these tomatoes coming from? And, uh, oh, these are imported from Holland. Well, <laughs> do you know? You know, and there's a, a huge company called Wholesome Harvest. And you know, I love the way these people choose these names. Well, it's all hydroponic. And the, the other thing, these guys have put together a front group that lobbies in Washington called the Coalition for a Sustainable Organics. I, oh, yeah, it sounds the, so good, yeah, right? That's it sounds the lobby. like they're the good guys, yeah, right? That's the lobby for the fake hydro organic. The other thing you want to, if there are small local farmers, uh, dairy farmers especially, buy your organic milk from them because the bulk of the organic milk in this country is coming from huge concentrated animal feeding operations out west where these animals never see a pasture even though the organic regulations require pasture now the the usda has just totally uh rolled over and belly up and let these guys uh, run all over it so let me just step back a second here <laughs> one of the things that gets so hard in life is the bad versus the good. Yeah. It just gets so old. It gets so, it's, and it's so in medicine and in politics and in gardening. I mean, and it, we're always dealing with it. And they're the good guys, like you, trying to do things righteous, good. We, I was saying that I, we were talking before the show went on. And I said, I just do this show. You know, I'm not selling anything. I'm just doing it when I'm not at this moment making any money. I'm just doing this because I love it. And you said it's a lot like farming. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you deal with that and not become such a crusty old fart? I'm getting, I'm having a hard time not yeah. becoming a crusty old fart. Yeah, well, what I think uh, the listeners to your show, let's take medicine, for example. Uh, they realize that there are all these same uh, pitfalls uh, in uh, the health professions, and they have figured out who is trustworthy, uh, whose uh, suggestions they want to follow. Uh, they've probably researched if their doctor has recommended X drug, whether they really want to do it or what, if whether there is a more natural alternative. And I would just suggest that they do that uh, with the... Uh, the food they buy, but with the extra concern that yeah, you want to take a double extra look at the organic food. This is so informative. Is there anything else you want to say? We're getting toward the end of the show. Well, I know what I want to do is I want when the company and travel, the country and travel is open again, I want to come knocking at forest farms. Well, you're always welcome, <laughs> uh, old friend. Uh, but I just want to say the only reason I don't get very upset about what I've just been talking about. I feel very level-headed, Elliot. Well, it, it allows me to encourage people to do what I think they need to do, is buy as much as possible from their local growers. And you want these people around. You know, now people are going into supermarkets with empty shelves. Well, you want to have a good relationship with a really exceptional farmer nearby. Uh, who, with, from whom you can buy uh, everything you need. Right. And that uh, If you talk about uh, good ideas for the future, that's one of the best ones. Yeah, you know, I, it's been a long time since, because my life has gone in these other directions, but this last month or two, I was thinking, I maybe I should leave the city and go back and get some land and go back to my roots of when I was with Scott and Elliot. I mean, it's just so perfect for speaking at this time. In fact, there was a really funny, some people are putting out, comedic little snips about the pandemic and some woman did this hysterical one where she showed her fingers and she said you guys that like women with a fake fingers 
I don't have them anymore. And we're women who like to get their hair done, we're going to lose out. It's the farm girls in 2020 are going to have it made. The ones that know how to get an egg from a chicken and get some veggies from that land. The farm girls, this is your year. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. Yep. I'll have to send you, um, you'll have to give me your uh, uh, email me your cell phone. I didn't get that from you. I was so excited to talk to you. I didn't do all the regular things I do with most of the guests, but um, so I can send you that little. Comedic. Well, uh, don't don't send it to my cell phone uh, because we don't get good cell service way out here in the country. So we are old fashioned enough that we still have a landline. <laughs> okay. What, I'll so give you, you the landline number. So, what's your computer like over there? What what kind of Wi Fi stuff do you have going on it? Well, it isn't season. really good, but the way we uh, get reasonable uh, service is we bought one of these uh, hot spots uh, from Verizon, this little cigarette pack size thing that sits on the windowsill. Yeah. And How many that people? Gets, oh, sorry. Yeah. That gets us better service than uh, the poor uh, service around here. The, the country has really, uh, the countryside has really been deprived on access to the modern world through uh, uh, Wi-Fi and, and the internet. How many people live in Blue Hill and live in um, Penobscot Bay? Yeah, that it's a fair. Blue Hill may have three or four thousand. I think uh, the town we live in has six hundred year round. And then, of course, since this is vacation land, as it says on the license plate, and everybody comes to Maine because it's cool in the summer and you can sleep. Uh, the population triples or quadruples during the summer around here. When I was fine. visiting, there were 44 people in Blue Hill when I was there oh, really? with you guys. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, no, it's, but uh, uh, we think uh, all the tourists who come up are great because we call them customers. And <laughs> <laughs> So I have one other question before we leave. So I remember that off the coast of Maine, there were two islands that Buckminster Fuller, a thought leader, ph philosophical thought leader, kind of similar to Scott, so to speak, and that he yes. changed paradigms. He had two islands called Little, I think it was Big Bear and Little Spruce, and he had composting uh, toilets and all kinds of things. And uh, my old boyfriend from the University of Michigan ended up becoming the president of the Bucky Fuller Foundation. And they, we used to hang out. So we hung out there. Are those still there? Do you have any? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that they're still there. And I occasionally run into people who are involved with it. Oh, wow. So oh, yeah. if I, okay, if I go there, I've got to do that too. <laughs> this is great. So is there anything else that you would want to say if someone's listening to the show and going, oh my God, I'm going to have to just grow some of my own food? Well, I that's just... the best, best thing they can, they can do. And what is fascinating is most of the popular seed companies that anybody who gardens has been getting their seeds from for years, uh, I think five or six of them had to shut down for two, a month or two this spring. Because all of a sudden, the world said, oh my gosh, food is going to become short. We have to grow our own. And all of the seed companies got so hammered with orders that they couldn't fill them. And they had to shut down their order lines just to allow themselves to get back on top of it. And so there is a new passion for gardening coming. As people say, gee, wouldn't it be nice if there was a, just a few... Uh, kale plants outside the, the kitchen when I wanted a little greenery at dinner. Well, you know, when I went to school, I had a garden for each season of the year and I had Nubian goats and I maintained yep. that all the way through school. But um, I did want to order lots and lots of seeds to do sprouting. And I've been buying seeds for many years from the sproutpeople.org and they wrote that their cart was closed. And if you yeah, put in order, exactly people, the right, same right, thing. Right, right. Yeah. So what you're doing is so inspirational and it's part of the lineage of my life of why I'm even doing this show and what my career and my life is about. But it is the perfect time to also create those seeds for more and more people to be doing this and appreciate here, here. it. You're here. 
Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I hope to see you in person and give you a big hug and hang out, really hang with you for a while and see Brett and see everybody and go on over to Bucky's Islands. Wow, blast from the past. (laughs) Well, thank you for allowing me to be on your show. It's been great. I love you, Elliot. I really love you. Stay well. Stay well. I hope to see you soon. Old friend. Okay. (laughs) Bye-bye. Blessings. Bye. (laughs) Bye Bye-bye.